This lesson deals with sinusoids and phasers. You can find these notes in the ECE 202 ebook in Chapter 8 starting on page 1. ECE 202 is a continuation of ECE 201 where we studied the analysis and design of circuits and systems. In this chapter we'll be looking at cosine functions, and we call them sinusoids in general. We again will be dealing with voltages and currents that are functions of time, but now as cosine functions. I graphed here, versus time, the voltage V of T. And you can see here we've got this sinusoidal shape. The value of V sub A is the maximum value, and we also get minus V sub A. You can do the same thing for I of T. The cosine function is equal to 1 when the argument is equal to 0. So if you set this equal to 0, you could solve for the value of t that would make the cosine function 1. And that turns out to be when t is equal to minus v over omega. In other words, you put that in over here, you wind up getting then the omegas canceling, and you get a minus v plus v equal to 0. With sinusoids, there are some terms that we need to review. First one's called a cycle. And this is any portion of a waveform beginning at a specific amplitude and slope, and then returning to that same amplitude and slope. So if we pick the point here, we would have the same amplitude and slope roughly over here, and that would be one cycle. Now the time it takes to go from the first point to the second point is called a period. The reciprocal of the period gives a number of cycles per second. We call this frequency, the symbol f, and it has a value that's one over the period. The unit of frequency is cycles per second, but that was later renamed after Heinrich Hertz, a German physicist, in around 1960. Omega is called the angular frequency of the sinusoid function and has a formula relative to the frequency f by multiplying by 2 pi. f is 1 over the period. Units for omega are radians per second. The angle phi that was in our cosine function is called the phase angle of the sinusoidal function and it has units of radians, but most engineers use degrees and the conversion is to take the value in radians and multiply it by 180 degrees over pi. Let me do a couple simple examples. Suppose that we had one radian, then the value in degrees would be 1 times 180 over pi, and that would be equal to 57.296 degrees. If we had x equal to 1 degree, then we could solve for y in radians, that would just simply be multiplying this side by pi and dividing by 180, and that would be 0.01745 radians. If x were 180 degrees, we could then solve for y, likewise multiply this side by pi and divide by 180, when A's cancel, we want to get the value of pi, which is 3.14159 radians. The value of V sub A, or I sub A for our cosine function, is called the amplitude. The difference between the max and the minimum would be twice V sub A, or twice I sub A. We call that the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude of the sinusoidal function. Here I've sketched V sub A times the cosine of omega t, it's the dark line over here, Sketch the same cosine function, but with a phase angle of minus phi. When you have a negative phase angle, it shifts the waveform to the right. That's a dotted line that's here. If you have a positive phase angle, it shifts the waveform to the left. This is important when we're in lab and taking measurements to see whether our angle is positive or negative. Let's next consider representing a sinusoid as a vector. Suppose that I have a voltage or a current that I could represent as a magnitude of f of a times the cosine of omega t plus phi. Now if I drew a vector whose length was f of a, and I projected that onto the x-axis, that would be multiplying by the cosine of the angle between uh, the x-axis and the vector. And that would be the value of this function when t is equal to zero. Suppose I draw another axis here where I have amplitude this way and time this way, and project that red dot over here. That would be the value of my f of a cosine of omega t plus v when t is equal to zero. Now imagine that this vector rotates at an angular velocity of omega radians per second. This is called a rotating vector or rotating phasor. It was first proposed by Charles Steinmetz in 1893. He is sometimes called the father of electrical engineering. You can find his bio and many others on the ECE 202 homepage. There's a button that says historical figures on it. Okay, let's go back to this rotating phasor idea. So here's this vector rotating, and as we project points down here, so as you go from the red to the blue, and then when the vector gets over here, projected over here, what you're getting is the cosine function versus time. The vector at t equals zero we call a stationary vector, and this is what's called our phasor. It has a length of f of a, and has an angle of phi with respect to the x-axis. Now if we have other voltages and currents in our circuit, we could represent their magnitude and their angle the same way. 
If you have a voltage or a current in a circuit with just inductors, capacitors, resistors, and controlled sources, all we're going to get are integrals and derivative relationships with voltage and current. But when you integrate a cosine function, you get a sine function of the same frequency, or you can represent it as a cosine with a phase shift. So all the voltages and currents in our circuit could be represented by vectors of a length representing their amplitude, and then an angle representing their position at t equals zero. Now they're all rotating at the same angular velocity because they have the same frequency. A sort of a merry-go-round exists in which all the vectors are riding. This merry-go-round is called the frequency domain. If one is in the frequency domain, revolving with the vectors, they appear to be standing still. Thus the amplitude and the angle of voltages and currents could be captured by their stationary vectors or phasors at t equals zero. We'll show later in the chapter that the phasors can be manipulated using ordinary rules of vector geometry or vector algebra. When the resultant vector or phasor has been obtained, its projection onto the x-axis gives us the time function solution of our problem. Stepping onto this merry-go-round is called transforming the problem into the frequency domain, and the resultant vector in the problem is called the frequency domain solution. The process of finding its projection on the x-axis is called transforming the resultant into the time domain. This is like jumping off of the merry-go-round. These are some of the properties of sinusoids and phasors.